Um, I'm just going to abuse my position as sort of chair or facilitator of this session to just ask a few questions or throw a few things in for discussion. And then after that, I think I'll open it to the floor. Um, after about half an hour or so, you may desperately want to walk about and do something, so you may split up into groups just for that kind of purpose rather than anything else. But there's just th three points, I suppose, I kind of wanted to make that might um, kick us off. Um, the first one is I noticed that you use the term creative work and creative workers rather than cultural work and, and cultural workers a lot. And I'm, I wasn't sure whether that was significant enough or not, or not. But in a recent piece of work I've been doing, as I mentioned before, with artists, people who are working uh, primarily in the fine arts and the cultural industries, I noticed that in their self-descriptions, they tend to distinguish quite strongly between the cultural work that they do, the artistic work that they do, and other kinds of work. And I was just wondering about the degree to which you feel that these notions of self-exploitation, the way that you uh, conduct yourself in work, what you expect from work, are transferable, in a sense, from one thing to another. Because I found that people distinguished quite strongly between them and felt that there was a sense in which sacrificing for art was one thing, but sacrificing in other kinds of work was, was another sort of thing. Uh, the second thing was about... Um, in a sense, a sort of broader question about what's the, what's the sort of progressive broad stance on these kind of things. I mean, if we take our minds back to 15 or 20 years, cultural industry developmental strategies were often about how do we get more people from marginalized communities, more working class people, more people of color, more women into cultural work because it's about giving people a voice. We want to get movies and we want to get uh, TV programs. We want to get records made by people who have hitherto been excluded from, from this. And so a whole series of kind of policy initiatives are actually about helping marginalized groups get into this rather precarious, uh, difficult, low-paid, unpleasant work. And I think that raises a sort of serious question about what's the, what's the right thing to do uh, in, that, in that kind of case. And the third one, I think, um, I suppose getting us back to one of the themes of the day, is about the role of the academy in this, which seems to me to be... Um, different or stronger or potentially stronger than in other kinds of labor markets because this is a labor market that the academy has such a big hand in producing in some ways and in, in and the whole expl you know, explosion of um, the cultural industries and the creative industries in the last sort of 20 years has also been underpinned by an explosion in, in mass higher education in, in training and producing these people. So it seems to me that the academy therefore has a kind of different sort of role in, in um, producing self-understanding of these kind of workers and it may have done in other kinds of non-graduate mm -hmm. labor markets. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drop myself Thank. on the wire here. <laughs> Thank. Thanks, Kate, for, um, <clears throat> for being so to the point and, I'll, and also brief, I'll try and be the same. Um, I, think, I think what you're, you're describing in, in the first uh, example the folks who make a distinction between what they do in their day jobs and what they might do after hours, if they have any after hours, um, is, is fairly characteristic of, uh, of professional life in a way. I mean, it, ironically, it's a fairly traditional element of professional life that you, you know, you have, you have, you know, you, what you do for Caesar and, um, <coughs> and what you do after hours, you do on a pro bono basis, or even academics have this version as well, where they do their real work in the summers, you know, they do their research, but the, uh, what they do in the classrooms is not real work. It doesn't really sort of, you know, express their, their identity in a way that is entirely uh, adequate to uh, their professional self-image. So I think that is a fairly traditional dimension in, in, in some respects of... Um, of uh, professional life or even sub-professional life, you know, the pro bono aspect. And certainly for, uh, uh, you know, in cutting edge industries like high tech, you have the whole open source movement where uh, all of these open source projects are, you know, done by engineers off the job and not on the t on their employer's time, uh, strictly speaking, although a lot of it is done on their employer's time. Um, the issue about, um, about uh, traditionally underrepresented uh, populations coming into this sector. I think it's a very interesting one because it, it ties up with a lot of the debate about ethnic entrepreneurship. And in particular, this, this sense that um, certainly for, 
for people who, from communities that don't have a long tradition of wealth and self-subsistence, um, people are much less, for people with those backgrounds, are much less likely to feel drawn towards any notion of voluntary poverty, any kind of sacrificial labor ethic that would go along with them being inducted into the creative sector are much more likely to want to feel that they want to get paid in full in every respect whatsoever. And that, that can go either way um, uh, when it comes to uh, um, <coughs> how experiments in the creative sector work out. The last part, the academic labor movement, is a huge topic. I mean, it is absolutely crucial and, and germane to what we're discussing here, and I hope we don't you know, lose sight of it, um, uh, that this really is, that, that this workplace, this is not a neutral, <laughs> a neutral location. Uh, it's part and parcel of, um, of the problem and the solution. And in fact, uh, probably, arguably, more than anywhere, uh, the moral credentials of the most precarious members of the academic profession um, are, are, the, are the ones that are proven to be the most important and active and progressive, uh, that it is indeed the adjuncts and graduate teachers who have been in the moral vanguard of the academic labor movement and, and have, have been claiming power for the precarious, if you like. And, and, and that's, a, that's a very important case study. Uh, I was just reading about the most recent, um, the most recent developments is actually here in California. Some of you will know more about this than I will, but the California Lectures Union, Lecturers Union, have, have managed to uh, get a contract with the, the um, uh, Teachers Federation. Uh, they managed to get a contract that's very close to tenure light, what's been called tenure light. Um, which means after six years of temporary employment, your job gets pretty well regularized and it's very difficult to get laid off without, uh, um, without some particularly egregious reason. And, um, and that's being cited as a gold standard in a way. I mean, having come... It's Sorry? It's definitively met. I mean, the response of the institution, like the University of California, is, is to lay you off in your right. time. In your fifth year, <laughs> yeah. Driven, you know, and why artists do what they do. Um, different communities, I think, look at art and work in different ways. And, and, and it, it seems to me that not all artists are driven by 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 money. If that's that seems to be the impression that I have, that the bottom line has to be money. And, and I guess I'm old-fashioned to think that uh, there, there are many many artists out there who are not necessarily driven by by that, and who can have a day job as a as a mechanic or or even cleaning cleaning motels, right, but go home and they either paint or they write or they write songs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and they don't want necessarily any compensation for that. They just do it for, for the love of, of, of the art. You know, is, is, is maybe, has that disappeared? I don't know. Is that even any consideration in your, in your, uh, in your studies? Uh, you mean has it disappeared in reality? No, no, no. I mean, is it, do you consider that? Do you, in other words, also, uh, um, uh, Ms. Oak, Oakley, uh, you, you've interviewed a lot of artists. Right? And I think, have you come across that? In other words, you say there's, there's a distinction you know, between what artists uh, say about their art and, and, and then you know, what, what, what compensates them in another way in order to do their art. Actually, I would say it's become part of the problem um, in many ways. I mean, just directly and bluntly, which is this, the, 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 nor the normalization of this idea that you would, you would indulge in creative endeavor simply for the love of, of the product, the love of gratification, and so on and so forth. The way that has become internalized and adopted and, and enforced in industry, in the more industrialized creative sectors, uh, has, has been largely responsible for this idea that you work at a discount uh, in the arts. But, but, I, see the, the, but I, I don't think artists necessarily think that way. And there's, there's some artists out there that... No, that, of course that, not all artists that, think that, that way. That but, are, the bro that but the way in which that their mentality is being industrialized, that's what I'm getting at. I'm looking at that pattern. 
Well, I, I, there are communities, uh, in certain communities, I don't think artists feel that they're being industrialized, you know. They, they, they simply sing their songs in a very independent way for the joy of singing them for community or whatever. Maybe I'm getting this all wrong, who knows, but, but nonetheless, I think there's, a, there's an emotional aspect to this. There, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's, there's something else missing in your, in your analysis that, that is not at all communicating to, to me in a sense. Okay. You know, artists like to be independent, I believe. You know, there's a lot of, but, but, but many of them are tied to, are tied to, uh, once, you, once, you, once, once you, for example, you can publish in the, completely independently, you can publish your own work you know, as artist, as a writer. But once you get into Random House, then, then you're co-opted, then you, then, then you have to go through a whole different kind of mechanism, and that's going to cost you uh, freedom of how you write and how you produce. And also working with agents. Um, I wanted to come back to, or touch again, or push a little more on the issue of the Academy. Um, in this room of some months ago, David, like you had organized a, a conference on academic freedom, and Carrie Nelson was um, discussing the very question of solidarity among the sort of non-permanent um, faculty, of whom now 70% of all uh, post-secondary teaching is done by non-permanent. And, uh, and the people who have tenure, which is an increasingly small um, group, and, and saying that, in fact, I, contrary to what you were suggesting, that, that in fact, that um, the precariousness might uh, lead to better work conditions for those who are more precarious if the tenured people, in fact, sort of su support them. But what um, was suggested, at least in, in his analysis, um, was that the untenured folks, the temporary people, paradoxically identify with the administrators and, of course, view the tenured people as the enemy. And in some ways, it, it um, which makes sense on the level of that kind of consciousness, but it also indicates that it's very hard, I think, for us to uh, foresee what the academy is going to be like even in 10 or 15 years, and particularly if we think maybe I'm just being a little bit sort of resistant to the Marxist analysis, if we think that if we all get together and do certain kinds of things, we will be you know, free. I guess I'm a bit more skeptical about that and just wondering how this notion of precariousness as a form of solidarity and consciousness, how we might, you know, it may not work that way if people are identifying with the administrators and not the tenured folks. Well, there's certainly every reason to be distrustful of, uh, of tenured, you know, tenured cohorts if, if, you, if you're outside of that, if you're outside of that core. I mean, just to give one example, the, I think in, in Washington State, um, um, the AFT is pushing to restore the balance of tenured to untenured positions, something like 70 to 30 percent, 70 percent tenured to 30 percent, so pushing for conversion of part-time positions and uh, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of resistance to that on the part of the coalition of adjunct and contingent uh, uh, teachers uh, because these positions get converted a lot of folks will lose their jobs will lose their adjunct jobs I mean that's just one example of how uh, mixed units mixed bargaining units or mixed locals uh, tend to and usually do privilege the interests and needs of um, of, uh, of, of the securely tenured. But, I, you know, the bigger picture answer I think I would give to this is that uh, I, I always think that talk about the corporate academy, the corporate university is a very lazy shorthand. It's a very lazy kind of talk, academic water cooler talk. Um, because it, it, is, it, it only sees, it only sees the, the marketization, it only sees the the, the optimization, it only sees the managerial strategies coming in one direction. It's a siege mentality. It means we have this haven and we have to protect it and the, and the market, the corporations coming in. It doesn't recognize that, that there's a two-way traffic and that a lot of our work mentality and our customs and even some of our traditions of free speech have been moving into the corporate world and a lot of knowledge industry corporations, these, they have their own versions of this. I'm not saying that they have their own, they have some version of academic freedom, these open speech environments and a lot of knowledge work, uh, company workplaces. So I think what we have to really see is, um, is to see these developments in the context of an emerging, you know, the new mode of production of knowledge capitalism where, 
universities and corporations are no longer what they used to be, that they're mutating into new forms. And these entrepreneurs uh, who will be just as much at home on the corporate campus as on the university campus, these kind of Schumpeterian entrepreneurs, uh, they will see more and more of that kind of hybrid species. And that's, that's another manifestation of, of the creative uh, industry model employee that we're going to see more and more of. Uh, but it, it cannot be adequately described and analyzed by this kind of loose talk about the corporate university, I think. I mean, I understand why people do that, but it, it, it doesn't get us much further down the road. I, um, I keep thinking about um, but both what you've said, but also what you've said about, and, I, and, and one thing I, I keep, um, about how, the, I guess I'm thinking about the forms of exploitation that happen in, in the creative industries, and, and um, I mean, I don't know enough about this empirically, but from what I've kind of seen and, and read, my sense is that often that happens along some pretty kind of conservative lines of sort of, like sort of race and gender and class, you know, and, and but I feel like in many cases there isn't, um, it's like we can't talk about that stuff. Um, and, I f and this is where I'm also very, fr you know, I find, there are aspects of the auton like the theories of the autonomous. I find that stuff really useful in some ways, but I feel like they don't talk about those issues either. And it's like we're in a, in a completely different ball game now. Um, mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, and I, well, I think one thing I think about. I remember reading a little article about. Um, it was actually about um, sort of artists in, in New York City and commercial galleries and how there are very few. I mean, there's kind of very very few women being shown in the commercial galleries. You know, but but there was no feminine. But the, the author was talking about how there was no feminist contestation. Of this happening, as were very, very little at, at, at you know at the time, and and um, I mean I understand we want to I mean there are problems with identity politics and, and those institutional models, but what happens when these forms of exploitation go on and it's very hard to find the language or the, the tools to to mm -hmm. talk about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's been, I, to my knowledge, a lot of research done on these issues. There should be a lot of ethnographic research being done uh, on these issues. I think. You, you could probably estimate what the results would be, I mean, along the lines that you've suggested. Um, however, I also think, I mean, thinking just outside of the creative workplaces, if you think about coalitions, for example, here in L.A., in the L.A. Labor Federation, uh, think about that recent, um, I don't know if folks were involved in the recent march from Hollywood to the docks that took place in, in, in the spring. That, that seemed to me to be a, a fairly crystal clear example of how you go about trying to do a cross-class coalition uh, that is transracial in every respect. I mean, these were, you know, laundry workers, uh, uh, domestic workers, stevedores, artists, writers, actors from Hollywood. Uh, a real effort on the part of the Federation of Labor to, uh, uh, to have some kind of impact on realizing that coalition. And, um, you said you were active in that? I or you? tried, I organized people to go out and do the dogs thing, but I actually was working on campus as a teacher. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Did anyone have an, a closer relationship to it in, in this region or know more about it? It was a big deal. It was a big deal? Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, because you had people about the LA Federation of Labor, who represent, like you mentioned, like musicians, actors, teachers, people who work on airlines, and flight attendants, plus you know, janitors, people all across the spectrum. I mean, if you have the entire, you know, the longshoremen work, uh, longshoremen work, all across the spectrum of work, and, uh, doing one or another, it's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. It's more powerful than, say, having a precinct population, like, you get it's not or Right. Have concerted effort to get everybody out. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been unthinkable in New York for an event like that to happen. Absolutely unthinkable. And I think that the, with the locals, but do you disagree, Rick? I don't know if I think about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the understanding of why it should take place is, is, is there, and, and certainly the Central Labor Council now, because it's under new management. But the uh, the, pra the difficulty in making it happen would be insurmountable. So if there's something to be said for regional specificity there. And whatever is in LA, whatever is happening in LA, not just in the labor movement, but in, in the general culture of laboring, is, is quite embryonic, I think. 
Uh, a lot of the discussion that we've been having speaks to the complexity of, of these issues and that when you push in one direction there's counter forces or that you are always treading on very contradictory terrain. And I'm thinking of, uh, I'm shifting away from the academic labor and its alliances to a different scenario. And I'm thinking of, for example, all the mapping uh, documents initiatives in, in Britain that had as an ultimate goal, whether or not it was fully realized or not is another story, of being able to really export a lot of IP uh -huh. driven cultural work, uh -huh. design, architecture, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and that brings into play the international scenario. This is if, if our creative industries here are going to gain power by also increasing their exports in the kind of global economy where it's necessary. You can no longer, if, if the creative industries in local sites find that they can no longer move their work further, then outside the country is one of the logical places. That makes it difficult, especially uh, protected by international agreements over intellectual property rights for people in different places than to ratchet up their IP. So this is one of the areas where I've seen less of a, let's say, a, a cross international alliance that's very visible. It's, it's somehow under the table, it's not as visible as uh -huh. something like migrants, right. women laborers, precarious, so on and so forth. It seems that you've seen alliances of that, but in those very contexts, yeah. the question of why migrants might be showing up, well, uh, that's obvious. The lack of jobs or certain right. kinds of jobs in other places. But that's also the case for a lot of cultural workers who cannot find the kind of cultural work they want to do, at least so they have to move around. And mm -hmm. I wonder what do you see for adding that to the mix of, of alliance and to really work on, on that area. I mean, it's another, it's another dimension to the intellectual property dimension is, of course, crucial. Um, and you have the same you know, division of labor there. There are the people who are above the line in, in the economy who are very close to the fruits or the spoils of IP, very close to being the authors who have some kind of claim on these spoils, and then everyone else below the line who have really very remote claim on the spoils. And most of the, most of the combatants in the IP wars, um, you know, beginning with Lessig and all the others, they, they, they tend to argue in the name of the would-be authors, the, you know, the authors who are being cheated in some way or thwarted. But these are all mostly above-the-line employees in some sense above-the-line workers, and they, they very rarely ever speak to uh, the conditions and, and the claims, the non-existent claims of below-the-line employees. And that's a huge division of labor, and increasingly um, uh, the line uh, where it's drawn uh, in, in increasingly relegates uh, l large populations to deprivation and ultimately to poverty in an environment or in an economy which is so dependent, which is so IP-driven. So the cross-class coalitions obviously have to be all about transcending that line, which is very rigorously drawn. I just wanted to um, kind of return to a comment that you kind of made in passing, um, but I think it's like, it's an important thing to think through. and. You were talking about what kind of work academics are qualified to do or contribute to creative industries. And at one point you said um, that academics may be more qualified to answer the question, what makes a job creative, than, say, a policymaker. And on the one hand, I think that's a great assumption. And then on the other hand, when I think through that um, and think about whether the academics that surround me are qualified to assess what makes a job creative. <laughs> Huge question marks <laughs> emerge in my mind. And so 
I'm just wondering if you've thought through that in more depth and detail and thinking about what kinds of credentials an academic would have to have in order to do a kind of creativity assessment or um, if you've thought through specific examples or people from certain disciplines that or certain coalitions um, that have been made between academics and other organizations um, yeah. so that yeah. it just seems like we need to sort of substantiate that a little bit right. further. Um, well, let me try to clarify. Uh, what I think I said was was that academics, I mean, they have, they have the, the research time and the research support to undertake studies of the quality of work life of creatives. You know, part of which involves what makes a job creative, but really about the, what is a good job for a creative? What the creatives consider to be good jobs, because policymakers have not asked those questions. They're not interested. None of their surveys have anything to do with the quality of work life. And it's not that academics themselves, by virtue of what they do, are, are attitudinally um, um, conditioned to answer those questions. It's just that you know, we have research time, we have research support, and that one of our uh, points of entry into this field of creative industries, I'm suggesting, could be that some of us might undertake ethnographic uh, investigations or inquiries, not just ethnographic, but ethnography would be one of them, um, finding out what is a good job for creatives. Because no one's ever asked. Actually, I want to kind of uh, hopefully, that's okay, uh, transition right actually into what you're saying and actually kind of address Alejandro, is it? Uh, sort of what you were talking about with regard to the, the quote unquote independence of the artist. And I want to, uh, being an artist actually, other than an aspiring academic, um, I want to work to dispel that myth and, and say that uh, far from artists wanting to be independent, uh, I think you'll find if you go to galleries and museums, at least in the United States, and you look at their CVs, that the overwhelming majority of them have MFAs. In other words, that they're thoroughly institutionalized, they're thoroughly professionalized, and far from wanting to be you know, against the status quo, uh, want to actually completely embrace the system of galleries and, and selling their work commercially and, and have full-time careers as, as artists. Uh, thanks a lot. It occurs to me that, and I'd like Andrew's view on this, this relates to some of the debates about the death of amateurism, very lively debates over the last five years in particular. And I wondered about that, whether it's the death of amateurism or the triumph of amateurism and how this, the discourse of artistry, whether or not it describes people who are doing community-based art or professional art, has become a dominant ethos within the creation of jobs of all kinds. I think that's what Andrew's getting at. In other words, what William Baumel called the cost disease and the idea that artists accept and put up with satisfaction through an autotelic notion of what they do versus a remunerative one because of the nature of the cost disease has become not a cost disease but a cost success, mm -hmm. a cost panacea. I think that's what he's getting at. But an example I'd be interested in that doesn't fit any of the notions we've got is that of the supposed triumphal figure in all of this neoliberalism, which is the sovereign consumer. And the example I'm thinking of is the person who signs an end user licensing agreement any of you who play online ele electronic games that are commodities have signed these EULAs. How many of you have signed a EULA at some point? Okay. <laughs> any of you who watch HBO uh, or go to HBO websites, if you are a fan of HBO Latino and you watch boxing and you join the HBO Latino discussion groups, you've signed a EULA. What that means is that if, for example, you decide you want to go online and either pay money as a consumer to play a game or offer up simply your ideas, your feedback to HBO, you've lost all intellectual property that is created by those acts. Every single word that you produce, every actantial maneuver that you make, every narrative innovation that you offer becomes the property, in the case I'm, in, I'm referencing, of Time Warner. So you might be paying, in the case of Showtime or HBO, a, a sum a month in order to watch the boxing. You might be giving up some of your ideas when you sign on to the website to make commentary. 
And certainly you're paying a monthly fee, for example, if you're playing an online game. And each move that you make, every time you are indexically identified, your ideas become the property of somebody else. So where does that fit in the notion of the precariat, the notion of the amateur, the notion of either the ideology of the artist or the transfer of the cost disease to the cost panacea? Well, I think they're very important questions, Toby, and what, what you're pinpointing or describing concomitant with the death of the amateur really is the rise of what is compulsive or necessary volunteer labor uh, on the part of consumers, citizens, uh, everyone whose waking moment of their lives can in some way be perceived to be contributing uh, to uh, the general social production. Um, and I think what's different about, um, you know, there was a, uh, thinking back to the period of the debates about postmodernism when all the debates were about the commodification of every aspect of your waking life. This is a different paradigm in a way. We're living in a different moment because it's all about the recognition. And it's not about consumption com of, of commodities that are produced elsewhere or the commodification of consciousness. It's about our active participation, the active participation of our labor and our work in the production of society. And that's a different paradigm, I think, from the one that um, really occupied so many people in the debate about postmodernism. Uh, because at, at that time, people really did perceive they were still living through the legacy of that idea that, uh, that the, the end of production, at least for employees, was to have recreational time, was to have free time. And the subsumption of life by work in our era increasingly has taken us into this different paradigm now. And I think that's what a lot of the creative industries discourse is about, trying to figure out what the how that happened and what the consequences of it will be. I just wanted to mention um, uh, one uh, pernicious use of the idea that art shouldn't be, art making shouldn't be compensated because it has its own rewards, it's intrinsically self-gratifying. Uh, has anybody in here besides Dick Hebditch taught in an art school? Okay, so you know that uh, 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 you're not paid very well, a few benefits, pension, no tenure, uh, and the reason that is given by your institution is that you're all practicing artists, you know, and, you, and of course, you know, you're selling it hand over fist, you know, so uh, the compensation for people who work in art schools does not have to be in any way adequate to support you to make a living as an artist. It strikes me that uh, many of the things you, you mentioned about the, the work life for the artist and, uh, and the precariat and stuff like that has been uh, already studied by you know, people like Pierre Bourdieu and Walter, Walter Benjamin before. Uh, and pretty much, how much did it change since Baudelaire until now? I mean, did it change much, you know, what uh, that um, increasing uh, volume of work the artists had to put themselves through in order to make it in life? Benjamin, Benjamin's ideas about um, active, um, active consumers in a way, the, the idea of the progressive media, the progressive media ideal that citizens would be active media producers and so on and so forth. I mean, who could have foreseen, you know, in the age of of YouTube and all these Web 2.0 social networking models where there's so much work and labor, amateur ordinary labor that goes into the participation of these, um, into participation of these models, um, where is the revenue extracted from that? Where is it? We're only beginning to figure out what the revenue flows are from these models. It doesn't look good so far. It looks kind of unsavory. Um, but in some ways, it's, uh, you, could, you, know, you could say of, of that, what Benjamin was arguing for, be careful what you wish for. Uh, because what it, in some respects, that ideal is turned into something that is really quite unsavory, the involuntary extraction of labor from ordinary, um, uh, from ordinary citizens, if you like, the ordinary citizenry. Right? 
That's a big shift. No? You could say it's just a massification of something that was an avant-garde idea. Um, but that's trite. Just a, just a quick comment about art schools. I mean, I was a rep for sessionals in an art school, and what he said about, oh, it's an arts-related job, so you should be so lucky. That's exactly the line that management used. <laughs> um, but I mean, the other thing is, you're, you're talking about you know this, this event you went to um, about precarity, and people said, well, you know, they're not really precarious. I'm wondering if they also said the line, oh, they're all a bunch of rich kids, you know, and and they're not really exploited, and also that it's a choice. I mean, because I feel like those are the lines that people often use when you try to actually raise that issue, and it's a kind of just and, and how do, how do you respond to those kinds of? The problem with the, that it, it's all a bunch of rich kids is that in certain parts of the cultural labor market, that's becoming true. Yeah, that's, um, so that's, that's, that's actually what's problematic. That's my point I was trying to make earlier about whether mm -hmm. policy should seek to mm -hmm. stop it being just rich kids or think, well, if people are going to have to work for free and horrible conditions, they might as well be rich kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what we have to progress down to that. So I think people do say that, but I think that that is in some ways a uh, fair comment. The other thing that I, and I, I, you know, I, I argue again, when people come give me those lines, I argue against it that this kind of work uh, can be very precarious, can be very exploitative. But I also recognise, having spoken to, you know, probably hundreds of cultural producers of one sort or another, artists of one sort or another, that the element of self-exploitation involved in this is very great. People love doing this kind of work very often, and they often speak about the love and, and pleasure that they get from it. And therefore, there's one story which is about uh, networks and increasing kind of organization and sort of labor unions. And there's another story about the massive oversupply mm -hmm. of labor in these markets that makes it very difficult mm -hmm. to kind of organize them in a sense. So you've got this kind of work which is badly paid, precarious, uh, increasingly um, mobile in a sense, despite what we say about place, increasingly kind of um, such a job showing everybody wants to do it. I mean, everybody wants to do it. So it's actually really difficult, both for kind of union organizers, but if you have a policy point of view, to know what to do with that, with that issue. I'm sorry, you yeah. yeah. offer us the category of precaria um, to think about multi-class uh, moments of solidarity or perhaps provisional um, mobilizations in, in some way perhaps allowing us to think about emancipatory politics or provisional moments of you know this kind of gathering coming together and doing a march across class and I was just thinking about what the goal of this category is or how we can think about what this precariat precariat does if I accept your um, this formulation that you've provided us because I was just thinking about something that happened in an area that I, I'm a little bit aware of and this is in South Korea where actually I think this moment came together where um, right now for the last about five to ten years um, in South Korea there's been an immense immense um, incorporation uh, or not incorporation but influx of foreign migrant workers in a society that calls itself the most homogeneous society in the world um, coming from one kinfolk in this constructed imagination of their history and identity as a Korean homogeneous culture and so there's been this huge movement and because all these um, foreign migrant workers have come in they've uh, they've uh, without any rights working in these remote factories in the rural areas there have been all these movements especially by artists and so there have been pop-ups of of group art art groups that work in solidarity with these farm migrant workers and you see them on TV like uh, uh, singing uh, songs that l they learn from their fellow Korean compatriots you know they their Lincoln uh, arms are linked in public gatherings and social protests where um, you know I think it's a moment where this kind of precariat uh, emerges mm. um, but my question and the problem that I saw from that was that uh, as long as these farm migrant workers are speaking Korean language, are learning Korean culture, are somehow, and there are also a lot of them marrying into Korean, um, intermarrying, int doing international marriages, and so they're somehow accepted on a cultural level, and then all the mobilization, like that you call for class, somehow, I don't know, it disappears. So that these moments of, these provisional moments of solidarity and protest and coming together all somehow are forged into this, oh, well now we sing Korean song. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but now we're accepted into this Korean culture and so they dissipate, or that's what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering um, how you 
you, you call it zone of contestation, but contestation for what? And what is this precariat uh, category? What is the goal of the precariat? Because in my particular, I don't know, yeah, just I, this I, example I, I'm thinking about, it. it, yeah, it's, it's, it I think it's a parts. very good example. And, and I think the, you know, the shortest answer is that really it's a, you know, I guess is what Stuart Hall used to talk about, a politics without guarantees or a politics of articulation where you have a, a structure that is there that gets filled in and is serviceable. And in any case, is unavoidable, precisely for, for the reasons that you have societies like this that were previously quite homogenous and uniform that are no longer so. And so these coalitions are, are just inevitable and necessary. And whatever you think about the concept of the precariat, I'm, I'm not a cheerleader. I'm just trying to, th to respond to the concept as it's been put forward. Um, it's, it's much too diffuse a concept uh, to, um, you know, to really um, um, to really establish the kind of formative allegiances that are required of traditional political pressure and action. Um, but the fact is that too many people now share the experience of, you know, this radical uncertainty about their future for that experience to be an exception rather than the norm. You know, the intermittent life, the indefinite life is increasingly becoming the norm. And I think we have to remember in, in the larger scheme of things that, that brief, the brief for this moment of what, they, what was called standard employment at that time was a tiny exception to the rule of work in modern times. It was a brief interregnum. Um, it was a very, there was a lot of virtue and nobility that went into struggling for those conditions that were associated with the security of the for this moment. Um, but a, a tiny exception to the rule of work in the modern world um, that was only enjoyed by a, a small slice of the population in industrialized countries. Self-employment is actually uh, is, is, is the normative way of work for most of the world's population, when it comes down to it. That's a sobering thought. Um, but so, so I'm, I, I approach it, uh, certainly not as a cheerleader, but, but as someone who doesn't want to dismiss uh, these new ideas and concepts that are proving to be mobilizing for young people in those circumstances, and, and to try and respond to it by filling in content if possible. It's a rather abstract response, but I think you get the idea. Um, I just wanted to, to, to comment that it seemed to, particularly with the, the, uh, the example of YouTube and different sort of um, bottom-up content production that you were talking about, uh, that you know, the main issue there seems to be sort of the ownership of communications infrastructure and various things like that that allows for that exploitation to take place because um, basically because of the way that the, the internet is either regulated or deregulated, De depending on how you look at it. And uh, it just occurred to me that in terms of what Kate had, had talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jam uh, jamming from above. Yeah. <laughs> um, that what Kate had talked about in terms of, uh, you know, possible academic rules or, what, or whatnot for um, ameliorating some of the circumstances for precarious or uh, flexible or self-employed sort of uh, classes and creating cr cross-class consciousness and things like that seem to be uh, for perhaps a brief moment addressed in the, some of the sort of open source movements and whatnot in the early days of the internet and somewhat now the, and the main problem that they had is that they tended to take place within content areas that were largely intangible and couldn't command the same sort of market um, pressure or market position that somebody uh, or some corporation with a larger actual physical infrastructure that's able to, you know, c uh, control those sorts of things, um, I was talking about, uh, can. And so it seemed to me that, that I, I guess this is more a comment than a question, though I'd be interested in, uh, I mean, I guess the question form of this would be whether or not um, the, the sort of uh, collective bargaining of, I guess this would mainly ap apply to IP work and knowledge work, uh, might take the place of sort of 
you know, individual voluntary collective ownership of, of internet communications infrastructure insofar as that can take place in a very public but not necessarily entirely local, uh, you know, it's not like infrastructure in a, in a specific geographic locality. It can take place anywhere on the internet. And so it seems to me like there's a lot of opportunity for um, collective bargaining in, and collective ownership as well as academic sponsorship of some of these sorts of ideas in the broader culture. So I'm sorry that was disorganized. I don't know how to answer that usefully, but I suspect there probably is someone here who can uh, because it seems to me a very important question. Does anyone want to? No? Okay. You know, one of these things when we're sort of thinking about these traditional, like, divisions, this relationship of labor, you know, there's these new possibilities that are opened up by the rise of new networks. And so you have things like the crowd, right? And you get the labor, the labor of the crowd that's doing things even in, uh, you know, creative communities like stock photography, for example. There's like iStock Photo now, which is the mass amateurization you know, as technology has, has increased, you have the mass amateur, amateurization of something like stock photography, where, which has gutted the market. Um, and all of a sudden, you start to see new possibilities and new problems that open up, you know, from the rise of the labor of the crowd and the mass, you know, the labor of a mass of unpaid or low-paid uh, uh, people who are, who are participating actively in this. And, I don't know. I think I think when you end up with talking about things like open source, you sort of get to the same problems when you're looking at these more traditional ways of looking at labor and service economy and and uh, these things that he was touching on. Does that contribute to your question at all? Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I find interesting is that what used to be considered uh, recreational activity, and not the word labor has become labor because it's monetized activity. Uh, that, that would be, for me, the defining criterion what would make what, what people would do in fan clubs and not necessarily get paid for 50 years ago. Now, in monetized activity, and it's in, in the little book on music, that's one of the issues that one sees. There's all kinds of activity taking place where people <laughs> didn't expect someone else to be profiting from what they're doing. And so it's in that, in that situation that, in, in a sense, that's a different kind of labor, I think, than other kinds of labor that have traditionally been remunerated and for which there's been kinds of struggles. Although there are struggles in this particular area, for example, in music, the, 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 in, in parts of the European Union and in Canada, there's the, um, the canon, it's called, right? On, on the purchasing of any equipment, and you have to pay a tax on that, and that goes then to the uh, rights associations, and then they distribute. The major problem there is that the artists feel that it's being distributed to a very small minority of artists, so everyone's getting ripped off by that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of rip-off in the kinds of remuneration schemes that take place, uh, let's say, in, in music and, and the question of rights. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it opens up a whole different way of thinking about what is labor. Uh, because it's not the kind of labor that I'm doing, like doing a design, an architectural design or something like that for remuneration. I'm having fun with my friend, right, on a network, and someone's making money off it. It is different and it is not, in a sense, because if you take the longer historical view yeah. about how, how artists' economies have functioned, there. It, for many art, I mean, for the most successful artists, there has always been the prospect of a jackpot economy, right? right? Immense, immense wealth and patronage and, and some degree of uh, uh, riches that, that comes um, as, a, as a windfall from the result of a particular work of art playing a particular role in a particular time in a particular place that has always been in excess of what we think of as, you know, fair compensation. So that form of monetization is, uh, yes, to the degree to which it, it, it is related now to recreational activity and can be harvested from recreational activity, yes, that's new. But in terms of artist economies, there has always been that prospect of, um, of the j hitting the jackpot, which is one of the reasons why the artist economy has become a kind of model economy for neoliberalism. <laughs>
because it all is it is about hitting the IP jackpot. But there's no jackpot in the recreational activity. No, not in, no, not in that. Not not in that. But there is a, well, unless you set up your own website that turns into right. a YouTube, which you, do. which you do. Well, <laughs> I wish I did. Right. Okay. Um, it's five o'clock, um, and I'm sensing that a certain degree of kind of restlessness, as it were, just from being in this Weariness. room, not, not intellectual restlessness. Um, so I'm suggesting <laughs> that we split up for half an hour in, into groups and come yeah, back at the end for a final session.